So you remember that uh, cell phone? Like the it was the Samsung Galaxy phone that just lit on fire in the plane. Oh yeah, that was gnarly. Yeah, could you imagine that was just in your pocket? You're like, wow, my my phone's just <laughs> getting really hot. Just a Decepticon <laughs> turning your phone on fire. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be speaking about batteries today, and we are really excited to have Noah Sumate, an associate here on our team who has been diving into the battery space over at least the better part of the last six months. Uh, at going, least. Yeah, going in deep on the whole sector. So Noah, setting the stage here, where are we at currently with batteries? And how do we get here? Yeah, so lithium ion batteries are currently the incumbent. And what we're seeing right now is that there's an evolution where new chemistries are coming online and there's renewed interest in finding applications beyond lithium ion where we can have those new chemistries serve a more niche role. So taking a step back, looking at the history of lithium ion, it started out about 30 years ago in consumer electronic devices. So think your iPhone. We still have lithium ion batteries today. And what's challenging is that people are now using lithium ion batteries as the kind of the catch all for the energy transition. We're treating it as if there's only one battery chemistry out there, when in fact we have hundreds, if not thousands, that are potentially candidates. So right now what we're finding is that in the automotive industry in particular, is the best application for lithium ion. So lithium ion, you don't want something that's heavy in your phone, you want it to be light. And that's why lithium ion is prized by the automotive industry. Very energy dense. Now what we're seeing is that in the energy storage space, particularly with stationary storage at both the residential, commercial and industrial, and at utility scale, is we're using lithium ion batteries um, for storage when we could be using other chemistries that may make more sense. Mm -hmm. Let me just pause you there. For all our listeners out there who might not have a solar system on, on their home, I guess, why do we need batteries and storage for stationary and like residential purposes? Sure. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a two prong question. So one of them has to do with the grid and then one of them has to do with the intermittent nature of renewables. So the grid is built to be perfectly balanced between supply and demand, which works perfectly when you have fossil fuels, which you can, you know, you can always burn more coal as needed. Yeah, you, you can, can spin stop up and spin coal. down exactly, really easily. Yep. Exactly. Not the case with renewables. So right now what we're relying on and what's kind of the backbone of our energy transition has been solar and wind. So both of those reliant on either the sun shining or the wind blowing. Now, in the event that the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing, you still need that same level of baseload energy. And that's where energy storage comes into play. So let's say you're overproducing during you know, um, a really bright day or it's extremely windy outside and you're overproducing energy and there's not that demand on the grid. Well, you can just store that excess energy in a battery for a time when, let's say, it's dark out or when there's not as much wind blowing. You can draw on that already existing electricity that you've stored in the battery. But what you're saying here is that we shouldn't think of batteries as one size fits all or one chemistry answers all use cases. It's, hey, lithium ion has some great advantages such as being lightweight. Yep. And so that works really well for applications like cars. But then there are going to be other applications where maybe you don't need to use lithium ion because, for instance, like lithium ion is expensive. It's expensive, it's flammable, and it's in short supply. So this is another issue. And, you know, I'm going to bring out a pun here as well. I've also spent a lot of time digging into mining. Um, and <laughs> this, guy's, this guy's got quips. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's the first time on the podcast, so got to bring some fun in. Yep. So batteries also play, you know, a very important role when it comes to stabilizing our grid. So as I mentioned earlier, the grid was meant to be balanced perfectly between supply and demand. Now, in order to maintain that balance, when there's a tremendous amount of demand at once, you have to step up supply and they charge a lot for that. Those are called demand charges. And they can account for up to 70% of your electricity bill in some areas. So it is a huge issue. And the way that batteries can help solve that is that there's a duck curve. So there's times throughout the day when there's more power that's used, and there's times throughout the day when there's less. So for example, when everybody gets home from work, the lights go on, people are cooking, you might turn on the TV, listen to some music, all of that requires electricity. So when you have a lot of people getting off work at 5 p.m. and then all at once there's this massive you know, amount of demand on the grid, you need to step up power generation technologies to match that. So right now we have something that are called peaker plants, which is you either burn natural gas um, to create electricity or you'll burn coal. Now, energy storage can serve as a substitute for those peaker plants, and it can help kind of flatten that curve by discharging their load 
during that really high demand time. So that's how energy storage can play a huge role in strengthening our grid and also helping um, you know, save some on that electricity bill. Got it. So we talk about, about the history of batteries, how we got here. Although we all carry the batteries in our pockets, many people are still big detractors on batteries. What are the biggest holdups on batteries and how is technology kind of solving for those issues? Yeah, so there, there's a couple. Um, so lithium ion inherently has some flammability concerns. And so that's something that you know we've been dealing with for quite some time. And that kind of goes into the specialization around the supply chains that I prefaced earlier, which is that since we've spent so much time dealing with this chemistry, we kind of know how to work around it. So that might be an independent cooling system, or that might be having a sprinkler nearby that can help put it out in the event that there's a thermal runaway situation. So there's ways you can play around that. A whole host of technical innovations on the battery side to how to address that thermal runaway issue, which we can get into at a different time. Sounds like the folks at Away need to implement some cooling technology so you don't always have to pop out those uh, <laughs> those batteries before you board the plane, huh? Yep, that's right. And and not only is you know the cooling you know and the thermal runaway is you know a, a consideration, but it's also an economic consideration because it costs a lot of money to have those cooling systems installed. And that's something that can really ruin the project economics. Yeah, it makes sense. You remember that uh, cell phone, like the, it was the Samsung Galaxy phone that just lit on fire in the plane. Oh yeah, that was gnarly. Yeah, could you imagine that was just in your pocket? You're like, wow, oh, my, my phone's just getting <laughs> really hot. Just a Decepticon turning your phone on fire. Yeah. <laughs> We've actually been having um, a couple of issues with that in New York. It was actually um, a topic of one of the conferences that I was at recently. And what one of the issues is, is that with the increase of DoorDash um, and other meal delivery services, you're seeing a lot of people using e-bikes. And as a result of that, you know, there's also been kind of a black market that's come up for those e-bike batteries to kind of push the price point down because again, lithium ion batteries are expensive. And as a result of that, you'll get some batteries that have been modified and those have been a source of a lot of um, fires within houses. And I've actually been quite lethal in New York because especially, you know, you usually charge your bike by your door. So if you're in a tiny apartment and that bike catches on fire, then you don't have a way out. So a lot of that has been attributed to aftermarket batteries that have been modified. So, you know, traditional lithium ion when handled appropriately at spec is a very safe chemistry that we have, again, 30 years of experience in operating with. Got it. So note to self and to all of our viewers, less uh, black market uh, lithium ion battery purchases. Yep, that's right. <laughs> yep, avoid it like the plague. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we talked about safety hazards with fire. We've talked about expenses with cooling systems. Obviously, mining is a you know carbon intensive or um, an industry that you know creates a lot of emissions, and we need those minerals for batteries, and so that has to be done through mining. But there's a lot of technology coming to clean up the the mining sector as well. So, so here we are now then in this battery world and a big transition into electricity. What are we going to do with all the batteries? Because they don't last forever. I think, you know, Cedric, how many laptops have you had or do you have sitting in your house right now that oh, just like don't hold a charge anymore? Yep. Right. Many. Or your phone. Yep. Right. After a year, you're like, oh, wow, this like phone lasts all day. And then after a year, you're like, my phone doesn't Double last. charge in a day. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So these batteries go bad. What do we do with them? Yeah, so you have right now, um, we're seeing second lives for these batteries. So automotive is requires the highest tier of performance when it comes to energy storage. So those batteries, you're driving around people in a car, you can impact other people that are on the road. You need to have the highest level of performance and the greatest level of confidence around that performance. Mm -hmm. So when you get to something like energy storage, yes, it's very important to have our grid balance, but it's much less so of, um, you know, somebody's gonna die because of our, our car explodes or whatever. So when you're looking at um, second life uses for these batteries, especially those that are coming from electric vehicles, a lot of it is as either commercial and industrial or small scale utilities energy storage. So they can find systems that can balance these different batteries that might be at different ends of their life cycle and kind of use them to make one single energy storage device that can really help serve a lot of the, the purposes that we described earlier when talking about utility energy storage. What about like yeah, like closing the loop, making it circular. Oh, that's, um, do that's, you think, yeah, that's, yeah, we should like mandate any, you know, 
battery recycling laws or? So I think the United States is taking a bit of a different approach to that. So we saw when looking at battery recycling, we have to look at China. So China adopted electric vehicles 10 years earlier than the United States did. So as a result of that, their battery recycling industry is roughly 10 years ahead of ours. And they have very strict regulations when it comes to the amount of batteries that have to be recycled, who's responsible for it, tracing those batteries. They have a very well-oiled system. So we're also seeing in the, um, in the EU, they've also recently mandated that um, they put minimums around battery recycling. So it's, it's something that I think the United States should consider. I think we're taking a little bit of an alternate approach when that we're subsidizing it. So with the Inflation Reduction Act, we're putting around credits where if you're producing recycled battery materials, um, you know, it can help make the economics pencil and make it a much more you know, attractive proposition. And that's something that we're seeing companies like Ascend Elements taking you know, advantage of today. Got it. And so for our viewers here, especially like what is getting recycled in these batteries? Is it like, is it just the casing? You know, you fill it up with new minerals and you reuse the casing of the battery or are the minerals itself, like can you pull the lithium out and actually reuse the lithium or is it like it's the battery is dead? Sure, yeah. So when it comes to those end of life batteries, they're first shredded. Um, so you break them down and then you get something that's called black mass. So then you take that through something that's called a hydrometallurgical process. And the result of that is you can strip out the most valuable metals and the lithium. So you can get things like nickel, cobalt, manganese, and lithium, which are quite expensive. Um, and that's really the value proposition that comes from recycling those batteries. And what we're seeing with companies like Ascend Elements is they're then able to take those raw materials and transform them into something that's called a cathode material, which costs for 60% of a battery's cost. So they're really able to make that into a closed loop circular play. Yeah, no brainer then. Circular economy around batteries, that also helps reduce mining. And with that, we'll wrap up there. Thanks Noah for your super insightful thoughts and perspective. This has been great. We'll definitely have to have you on more. For all those listeners, if you wanna see more, please comment, subscribe, like, share us your thoughts. If you have suggestions on what we should talk about, let us know. 